lovies, it's David McGillivray here with another edition of Little Did You Know, it's a chat show in which I talk to people I find interesting, I hope you agree. My guest today is the author of this book, Terence Fisher, Master of Gothic Cinema. Terence Fisher directed most of the most famous hammer horror films and this book is put out by the same outfit that published my own book shall i give you the <laughs> flash of it there it is that's enough of that but there's one major difference and that is that terence fisher master of gothic cinema has sold more copies in pre-sales than my book has sold after two years on the shelves. So clearly my guest is actually writing about things that people want to read. I could learn a lot from him and I intend to. Will you please say hello to the very wonderful Tony Dalton? Hello everyone. Hello Tony and where are you speaking to us from today? From deepest Somerset. Oh, how lovely. <laughs> um, and, and that's the reason why this is a Zoom call. It's the next best thing. I just couldn't make it to Somerset. Now, Tony, back in the day, and we're going back uh, nearly 100 years, horror films were expressionist because of the influence of the German masters. But both you and uh, John Carpenter, the director of Halloween, have said that in the 1950s, Hammer rewrote the horror rule book. What do you mean by that? I think a combination of things came together, a magic box of talent came together at Hammer Films. And uh, uh, I just think it all just worked for that period. It was post-war, don't forget, considered, well, 10 years post-war, uh, and uh, people were looking for something new. Uh, and I think there'd been horror films, yes, as you said, for the last, uh, since the early 1900s, uh, and again during the 1930s and 40s with Universal uh, Pictures. And Hammer came along, not only by using colour, but actually doing it in period, a period horror which was quite interesting. Um, there's a great debate whether the universal films are gothic, revivalist gothic horror. I don't personally think they were, nor did Terry. And uh, they, these films, these hammer films, this group, this milestone of films, um, just had this kind of look, this talent, the cameraman was right, the director was right, uh, certainly the set designer was right, and it all came together at the right time. And the first line of your book, uh, Tony, is there has only ever been one great director of classic British Gothic horror. That is, of course, um, uh, Terence Fisher. How come he justifies that description? He justifies it because he is. Um, uh, there are other directors of the period like Freddie Francis. Uh, Freddie Francis made a number of Hammer uh, films, most of them modern day contemporary psychological dramas rather than Gothic. Freddie didn't like Gothic. He, he, I wrote a book on Freddie as well. Freddie was very adamant that he didn't like Gothic at all. He only really directed a handful, possibly two, um, if you leave some of the amicus ones aside just briefly, uh, but two certainly for Hammer, The Evil of Frankenstein and uh, um, Dracula has risen from the grave, and they're gothic because of the period they're set in, uh, late Victorian. But Terence Fisher, why is he so great? Because the films he made were extraordinarily successful, um, and they still work today. I mean, here we are, how many years down the line? Uh, 70 years nearly down the line, 50, 60, 70 years down the line, and they're still incredibly popular, and they still look good. David, they still look incredibly good. Uh, and uh, actually, having watched them all again um, for the book, I was just amazed at how well they still worked. Yes, the horror had, all right, become less horrific um, with today's standards, um, but they were extraordinarily good stories uh, and they look so good. But is it fair to say that although the fans may adore the films, the critics never really liked them. Yeah, 
Yeah. yeah, absolutely. They At the time, they never liked them. I think Terry is being realised today uh, for the director that he was. He was the right director at the right time. He, he was an old-fashioned director uh, by hammer standards at that time. They had people like Val Guest and, uh, um, and various other directors, but Val Guest is probably their prominent one. Uh, and they were all fairly newish directors, whereas Terry was old-fashioned. He, he was an editor. He was old-fashioned. He liked close-ups. He liked tracking shots. He liked those things that make all of his films something very special and very classy. Tony, you've been working in films and TV since uh, 1969. Um, we were both at the British Film Institute. I was the assistant editor of this magazine, The Monthly oh, Bulletin. There's an issue that I assistant edited. It's got a horror film on the cover, The House That Dripped Blood. And look, it's signed by that little girl, Chloe Franks. Tony, what were you doing at the BFI? I was uh, I was in the film library in the cut in Waterloo when I first started there. I was only 21, I think, when I started. Tw yeah, 21. And uh, I then went on to the regional film theatres. And that's where I met Terry. Peter, people like Peter Cushing, Donald Pleasance and Terry. Um, the day I met Peter was the day I met Terry uh, on the set of Frankenstein and the Monster from Hell. Uh, and I went to see Peter and he introduced me to Terry and that's how I got to know him. Uh, so, yeah, I was doing lots of different things. I was actually doing interviews on stage, programming for regional film theatres, primarily uh, along the south coast. I did everything from Brighton to St. Austell. <laughs> I'm going to come back to you in viewing uh, Christopher Lee at the uh, National Film Theatre because it's of interest, Tony. But uh, um, uh, right now, let me mention, this is your 12th book. Uh, you've written five books about and indeed with uh, the special effects maestro Ray Harryhausen. As you uh, just mentioned, you've also written a book about Freddie Francis. But is, the, is it true that that book costs £72? <laughs> yes, sadly. I've written seven books, not 12, David. I, I haven't quite got to the 12. Um, but yeah, no, it, it is incredibly expensive. At the moment, uh, I'm trying to get the book back. I'm trying to get the copyright back on the book. Not easy. And the, the Francis family are, are trying to help as well. I've asked them for their help and they are willing to give it. So we've only just kind of started on that road. Uh, whether or not I will be able to get it back, I will obviously have to pay the money to get it back. But if I can give it to Fab um, um, Press, uh, as I do with the Terence Fisher book, I'd be very happy, uh, incredibly happy. Because uh, Freddie's book is very funny, incredibly funny. Yes, he was a very funny man. Well, Fab he Press... Was publishers of uh, Terence Fisher, Master of Gothic Cinema, is published on the 15th of September at a more reasonable uh, $24.99. Uh, Tony, you just said that you uh, met Terence Fisher around the time of his last film, uh, Frankenstein and the Monster from Hell in 1972. You hit it off. Uh, in fact, I think you spent the nights drinking together. Um, why did you become such friends with Terence Fisher and his wife Morag? I don't know. We just hit it off. We, we uh, not because of drink, uh, but we certainly hit it off. And uh, they had such a lovely, wicked, uh, gentle, uh, wicked but gentle sense of humour. Uh, Terry would love to have a joke and, uh, and we would talk and gossip and uh, uh, I would go around to their cottage, Holly Cottage in, uh, in Strawberry Hill and we would have a whale of an evening, absolutely wonderful. And we talk about everything. We talk about politics, we talk about uh, film, of course, um, but we talk about everything. Uh, and he liked talking about new films. I took him to see The Exorcist. Uh, um, sorry. Now that, that is something I want to bring up <laughs> right at the end of the show, because that was in 1974. Uh, but we are going to talk about that again. Um, before um, Terence Fisher got into the film industry, he had another job as a window dresser. And I rather like uh, a point you made, which is that it's quite possible that um, because he had to attract the attention of passers-by, <clears throat> he had to put interesting things in a frame. That's right. Window. And this probably was good experience for being a film director. 
I think it was. I think he thought it was as well. We talked about it quite often, actually. And I have to be honest with you, having seen some of the photographs in the book that I used in the book, and they were only two photographs of displays that he did for Peter Jones, uh, I, I think he had an eye. I think he already had an eye. Um, and that led to him going into uh, to editing and then to directing. Yeah, he always used to say that it was a good educational uh, grounding for me to actually catch people's eye, to do something that would catch people's eye. He certainly did that with the Hammer Horror films. Um, that's right, yes, he was, he was working for uh, Peter Jones in... Uh, in Sloan Square. Sloan Square in Chelsea, yes. It's it's still there and it's an Art Deco masterpiece. Um, yes. uh, Terence Fisher worked his way up uh, through the film industry um, from a clapper boy. And uh, later he directed his first films for a man called J. Arthur Rank. Now that name has disappeared almost completely from the film industry and your book tony is a reminder of what a mogul j arthur rank was i mean i had forgotten that he really ranks with some of the hollywood moguls doesn't he definitely i like it he certainly ranks I, I, definitely i think that's absolutely a good way of putting it david he 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 was really the British mogul after Corder, Alexander Corder. Uh, and he came slightly after Corder, but Corder was still around at the time. But he was directing, he was sorry, he was producing huge productions like Caesar and Cleopatra. Um, but no, he, he invented this wonderful idea, the film score, um, which was the charm score, it's often called, where Joan Collins started, Christopher Lee started there. And in fact, uh, Terry was there at the same time as Chris was, uh, although they didn't know each other then. They might have met, but they didn't know each other then, uh, until he directed his third film for Highgate, uh, which was Song for Tomorrow, in which Chris appears as a waiter, a, a maitre d' at a restaurant, uh, a terrible performance. And I think um, Terry reminded of that when, when they made uh, Curse of Frankenstein. Uh, I think probably Chris agreed with him as well. Um, but it, yeah, it, it was the most extraordinary school. And, uh, and Terry, as far as I am aware, um, it's difficult to get records sometimes, but as far as I'm aware, he's the only film director that came out of it. Um, that made a name for himself. And I could be totally wrong there, and please correct me if I am, but uh, I, as far as I'm aware, he's the only one that did it. And he, he, he was very, um, he, John Croydon produced uh, quite a bit of the uh, films there, all three of the films at, uh, at the studio at Highgate. And uh, uh, Terry was really very um, pleased um, with the three of them, uh, with John with John Croydon. Oh, hark at me correcting you, Tony, Sorry. but he was Highbury and uh, Highbury, and uh, it's it's long. Gone. It's it's been it's been demolished. Um, but while while he was there, um, he was uh, uh, he had to make films starring uh, as 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 you say Hollywood stars past their prime. This was a common practice in the nineteen fifties, wasn't it? Yes, it was. Um, yeah, I. I, I, I Sorry, you said that using people who were past their prime, did you say? <laughs> yes, a, a lot of the stars uh, no longer had careers in Hollywood, so they came to Britain to make these second features. That came after uh, Highgate, and I think uh, that was really in the early days of Hammer, when they had a deal with Robert Lippert, um, and he was directing uh, people, uh, you know, from Hollywood uh, that ha were slightly on the down. Zachary Scott was a very good example, although he had a resurgence in his career. But yeah, they used a lot. And Robert Lippert, the American producer on the, some of those early Hammer films that, uh, that uh, Terry directed, um, got a lot of these names. That was his, that was his idea, to get, bring in Hollywood names uh, as a name to sell them in, in, in America. Um, and that's why Terry met so Claudette Colbert. Uh, he, he worked with Claudette Colbert on one of the films. And uh, 
not one of her best. In fact, I think it was her last film uh, before she retired. Um, but uh, and he didn't particularly get on with her very well, I believe. Uh, so I'm told um, the continuity lady said that they had their differences of opinion. Although Terry wasn't a, a heavy director in the sense of demanding things from people, uh, he was very laid back and liked actors' input into a movie, very much so. But yeah, that was the trend of those early 50s films uh, when he went to Hammer, um, very, very popular to get so-called Hollywood names. It was uh, deemed to be very important at the time, that's right. Now, when uh, Terence Fisher began uh, directing for Hammer, he moved to Bray Studios, and Bray is a name that's almost as famous as Hammer itself, and you were lucky enough uh, to go there. Um, tell us, what was Bray Studios like? I went there really way after Hammer left, way after Hammer left. I went there to visit uh, Brian Johnson, who was making Space 1999, and uh, later on Alien. I, I saw the Nostromo uh, model for, for Alien. Um, so it was really, it had been and gone by then. It was a sad run down place. I never went with Terry, uh, regret of my life. We always promised each other we'd go. And I tried to arrange things, but it was always very difficult. Uh, and uh, then it was too late, of course. Uh, um, so yeah, it was a it was a wonderful location. The location was superb. Uh, and it was a wonderful, a wonderful place to go, uh, even in its rundown state. But uh, Terry adored it, absolutely adored it. It was a country house, wasn't it? It was. It was uh, the studios were attached to a country da uh, house, Downs Place, and uh, which was used in many, many movies. Um, and uh, it was just the most extraordinary. I mean, when Terry told me a lovely story uh, that's in the book about when they first went there, they used to use the rooms in the house uh, before they had proper studio um, uh, stages, uh, before they had... Um, uh, soundproof studio stages and uh, they used to have to stop filming sometimes in the room because the pigeons were making too much noise <laughs> and they, they would let a gun off but the pigeons you get used to the gun <laughs> what is bray studios now do you know i have no idea i somebody came we saw somebody um a dear friend of uh, mine uh, came down to see me last week, Colin Arthur. He worked on uh, a lot of special effects movies, uh, including some with Ray Harryhausen. And Colin was telling me that it was, I think it was Colin, uh, that said that it was very run down and it's, it's probably on the cast to be pulled down and houses or retirement estates going to be built on top of it but i i thought it had long since gone but apparently it hasn't so interesting that i'd i'd certainly love to see it before it is finally pulled down um, well i haven't been for a while but bray is now best known for a restaurant called the fat duck oh, yes it's very expensive and i haven't been there now hammer arrived just after the introduction of the X certificate and this meant that uh, films with an X certificate could not be shown to people younger than 16 years of age and Hammer really cashed in on this X certificate didn't they? They certainly did I mean the, the two best examples of that uh, um, the Quatermass uh, films uh, the well, Quatermass and um, X the Unknown. Uh, they use the word. They use the uh, the the letter X to emphasise that these are real horror films. Uh, so uh, Quatermass Experiment. That's Experiment. Uh, they used, and then X the Unknown. Um, both uh, both uh, one directed by uh, Val Guest, the first one, uh, the Experiment, and the second one directed by Leslie Norman, of course, who was a friend of um, Terry's as well. Um, didn't get on terribly well with Hammer or some of the technicians, Leslie, apparently, so I'm told. So Freddie, uh, Jimmy Sankster told me that. Uh, Freddie or, or um, uh, Terry would never have said that. But uh, Jimmy Sankster told me he didn't get on very well with the, with the, uh, with the magic box of Hammer. But yeah, they, they cashed in on the horror. I mean, they, they knew how to do it. They were very clever. Not only the colour, you know, blood. Is it to Michael Carreras said once, or is it the Colonel James Carreras said once, that blood wouldn't be blood without colour? And it's true. I mean, you see blood in black and white movies, it just looks like a 
black blob, but in color, you know, wow. And they really laid it on thick, literally. And you take Dracula, the opening of Dracula with the blood drips on the coffin uh, and over the name of Dracula. It's absolutely beautiful. And they used it for that purpose to sort of frighten people. And uh, uh, today it would be, you know, um, half the course. But then, of course, it was all incredibly new. Well, we're going to talk about um, uh, a couple of individual uh, Hammer films, the titles that you will remember um, in part two of the show. But right now we're going to take a short break for a trailer for a Peccadillo release. And it's a suitably gothic film. It's The Girl King. It's about the 17th century Queen Christina of Sweden. Have a look at this and then please join us again in a couple of minutes. I remember when you were born. Your first cry was so deep. We thought it was the long way to Prince. So we took it to your father and he unwrapped the blanket. He said, girl. <laughs> Happy 18th birthday. With your father's sword, Sweden is yours. Her Majesty Queen Christina. greatest challenge in the history of this country. Peace. Did you really miss me? I told Comtesse Barre you are the man who is dearest to me. You are the queen of a nation of filthy primitive bears. Who would want you? You will be free to do whatever you want. In public, Yanda. In private. I am convinced we can determine our destiny. But I am free, Your Majesty. I do not have a kingdom to govern. Long live Christina! I cursed the day I called you my daughter. That's uh, The Girl King. It's a Peccadillo release and it's uh, available on peccadillopod.com. And uh, playing Queen Christina there is Malin Busker. Although, of course, the, uh, the part will always be associated with the great Greta Garbo. Now, uh, Tony, uh, Terence Fisher and... Hammer. You've alluded to this in part one of the show, but I'd like you to talk more about it now. The look of the films was very distinctive. So in all the famous titles, and that's The Curse of Frankenstein and The Revenge of Same and Dracula and the Mummy and The Curse of the Werewolf, they all look very much the same, very distinctive. And you have a term for this, you've mentioned it, it's called the magic box. What was the magic box? Well, as I said, I think at the start, it was a combination of, of various things. Uh, primarily, uh, you've got three elements, basically. You've got Terry as the director putting everything together from the script. You've got a wonderful script by usually Jimmy Sangston, always Jimmy or Tony Hines, and you've got the set designer. Now, the set designer was Bernie uh, Robinson, uh, Bernard Robinson. He was, he had, he, Terry adored Bernie, um, just adored and he, he died in 1970, uh, Bernie, uh, just before Terry made, um, a couple of years before Terry made his final Frankenstein film. Uh, and uh, he, he, if you look at the sets, they are revivalist Gothic, uh, pure revivalist Gothic. In the purest sense, you, uh, I, I use the Houses of Parliament as a very good example, not just the exterior, but the interior. Uh, you've got the, you take Dracula, the fireplace, the library in Dracula. You've got that wonderful globe in the middle, which Bernie had put in um, before Terry got to the set and saw the set. And when Tor Terry saw that globe, he said, that's wonderful. He said, I'll have Dracula and, and uh, Van Helsing fighting around the globe. So you've got good and bad fighting over the world. 
Uh, and but you look at the fireplace in that it is absolutely spectacular gothic and they just they just knew how to make it and not only that the sets broke down very easily so terry could move his camera very easily in and out of the set um, and take a wall down and shoot from a different angle whatever he wanted to do he liked tracking shots terry so tracks take up a lot of room as i'm sure you know david so he he was very 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 happy with bernie and it Bernie's work he was and they worked together on all the classics the odd one out that you mentioned was curse of the werewolf that was uh, it was gothic and there's no doubt about it, it was gothic it's certainly victorian uh, but set in spain which was slightly unusual the reason it's set in spain was that they were going to make a film um set in spain hammer but about the inquisition but of course the censors objected to the screenplay so tony hines had to drop it the producer had to drop it and so they used the sets uh, and that's why curse of the werewolf is set in spain <laughs> no other reason now here's an interesting uh, thing tony um there is now a far bigger gap between uh, the golden age of hammer and the present day it's about uh, 60 years a far bigger gap than the gap between the universal horrors mm. and hammer arriving that was only about 20 years so isn't this interesting 60 years on the films are still on TV. Uh, we're still talking about them. Um, why have they stood the test of time? I think, as I said again earlier, I think the stories were so great. Um, and the actors, gosh, look at those actors. Just, you know, extraordinary roster of great British actors. Um, and uh, Peter Cushing, I mean, wow, well, you know, uh, as Terry would always say about Peter, you know, he could turn uh, a, a, a serial box wording into Shakespeare. And he, he really could. I mean, he was brilliant at whatever. The worst lines in the world uh, he would know how to deliver. And you've got all those actors, not just the main actors, but you've got the character actors, the people like Michael Ripper, uh, uh, um, Patrick Trout, wonderful actors. Uh, and uh, you, you've got all that combination. They still stand up today because of that, because they're well written on the whole. They're well written, timelessly well written. Uh, much more so than some of the universal ones are. There, there are several universals that I love, don't get me wrong, uh, about half a dozen, I would say. Um, uh, but the, the, the thing is with the, the Hammers one, the Mummy, for instance, is a very good example of that, um, based on an, an earlier universal one. It's much better than the uh, earlier universal one. It's based on two films of universal, one of the after uh, some of the latter universal films uh hunt mummy films but it, it, it the style is superb much better than the universals um well we're going to talk about uh, individual films not here on uh, youtube but uh, on uh, patreon instead and you'll know if you're a patreon subscriber you can uh, go there as soon as this show finishes you'll find us waiting for you if you're not a subscriber here's uh, the link um, uh, to uh, allow you to become a subscriber and indeed become one of us. Um, the, uh, the film we must mention, though, uh, in detail, Tony, is, is the one that started it all. So this was Terence Fisher's first gothic uh, horror for, for Hammer. It caused an absolute sensation. The question is, why did the curse of Frankenstein in 1957 cause such a furore? Because it was so original. Uh, to seen today, of course, it's not. Um, because you've got all the other Hammer films, you've got so much awe, uh, gore and nastiness and blood and guts everywhere these days in the films. I'm not putting them down, but they're completely different uh, now. But then it was, as I said, post-war years, 1957, uh, so 12 years after the war, uh, people were looking for something different, uh, something colourful but different. Uh, and uh, they still, they, 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 they certainly just fitted the, uh, they fitted the, the bill. Um, the Quatermass Experiment and X the Unknown had done incredibly well, but Hammer decided 
that it was the horror that people wanted, not necessarily the science fiction. Uh, the first two films were science fiction. But so when Curse came along, they chose Frankenstein. They didn't get permission from anybody, from Universal. Universal got very uptight about it and wanted to sue Hammer uh, because they said, you cannot take anything, the design of the creature or anything from us, otherwise we'll sue you. So I have to be very careful that nothing matched uh, Universal. Universal came around several years later and asked Hammer to start making some of their product like the mummy uh, and uh, um, the mummy and various other things uh, the werewolf and things like that and at the end of the day um, it, it is such an extraordinary film um, perhaps dated today but you look at just the introduction of the creature uh, where Terry opens the door, uh, Peter flings open the door, and you've got this tracking shot and then another tracking shot into his face. That shot really, really scared people. I mean, people were passing out. I know it sounds like a, um, a, a, a cliche today, but they really were passing out. It was quite extraordinary. And I have to say, uh, Chris's makeup is exceptionally good. It does look like a living corpse. Whereas Karloff, which was brilliant, don't get me wrong, Jack Pierce's makeup was wonderful. Um, but uh, I have to say, Chris's, I think I prefer because it does look like a living corpse. Oh, yes, yes. Now, um, uh, the, the Curse of Frankenstein was fo followed famously uh, by Dracula, and in 1959, um, Terence Fisher said, I like to think that 20 to 30 years from now, Dracula will be shown at the National Film Theatre. Now, in 1959, that was unthinkable. Yes. Only Hungarian masterpieces were <laughs> at the National Film Theatre, and yet, the unthinkable happened, didn't it? It did. It did. And uh, it, it is uh, like everything. In fact, when I came to write this book, I asked the uh, National Film Theatre, now called the BFI South Bank, one has to remember. Um, I don't know quite know why it's called the BFI South Bank, but there we are. Uh, it's. Uh, I, I said to them, do you want to do a season around Terry, a proper season, like the, like the French did. The French loved Terry. They always loved Terry. They were one of the first people to do an article on Terry's work. Uh, and uh, they did a complete season, almost a complete season, I think bar about six or seven of his films, including the ones he'd uh, uh, directed, the earlier ones that he directed, and uh, one or two, I think one or two that he'd edited as well, like Wicked Lady. Um, so, uh, yeah, it was unthinkable, uh, certainly in the 1950s, with Dillis Powell uh, really slagging off uh, Terry's movies and Hammer films. There was just no way. And, and Graham Greene, you have to remember Graham Greene's uh, reviews were pretty awful. The great writer, Graham Greene, he, he just couldn't see anything in them at all, uh, which was slightly sad uh, and upset Terry, I think, quite a lot, actually. Uh, and he, but he got his revenge. So that's all that mattered. Uh, this is something else we're going to come back to, uh, Tony. Uh, but I want to move on to the uh, the Hound of the Baskervilles, another one of the uh, great Hammer films, because you uh, go into great detail in your book about the problems they had filming the climax. Now, can you tell me um, exactly what was going wrong here? Well, it's hard to make a dog an ordinary dog, sorry, a, a real dog, look horrific. Uh, I, I lo I'm a dog lover, so I'm, I've got a dog, so I, I can't think of any dog that's horrific. They had this terrible problem of trying to make the dog look horrific. They tried um, to make it look big and horrific. Uh, they tried uh, having Peter Cushing, Chris Lee, and the girl, uh, played by children, so the dog looked even bigger. It was a great Dane, uh, the dog and to make the dog look even bigger. But when they viewed the uh, results of that uh, test, uh, Terry was appalled. He was just absolutely appalled. So was Tony Hines. They said, no, that, that's got to go. What happened to that footage? I'd love to know what happened to that footage. I could find... Because you say it looked like what it was, children. Yes. Children, yes. Well, Peter said that. Peter Cushing said that. Uh, and Terry said it. It just looked awful. He said, I knew it wasn't going to work. He said, but I had to do it. That's what they wanted to do. I had to do it. So in the end, uh, Margaret Robinson, Bernie Robinson's uh, wife, made a mask for this great Dane, which would have... Uh, I, I, it, it was more pronounced, the, the face was more pronounced, a, a little bit more bony to make it look like it had been starved as well as I think how they put it. Uh, and that's what attacks, so-called attacks uh, Chris Lee and, uh, 
and uh, and the uh, Sir Hugo at the beginning, um, one of my favourite films, The Hound of the Basketballs, I must say, pure Gothic and pure Dartmoor, although not filmed on Dartmoor, uh, pure Dartmoor for me. Uh, I love it. Every time I go to Dartmoor, I think of The Hound of the Basketballs. But it, even, it, even so, I believe, Tony, that the dog was still too friendly. Yes. Yes, sorry. Uh, yes, he was way too friendly. Uh, and uh, the, the, as soon as they threw something onto the uh, set to make him go, he, he was just he was just too friendly. I mean, he would lick people to death rather than uh, claw them to death. Uh, so, yeah, slightly uh, it didn't. It was difficult. I mean, today, of course, you do it with CG. I mean, there wouldn't be a problem. You would invent the dog from from absolutely basic. You'd make it far more uh, huge and far more fangy and far more bloody. Um, but uh, then, of course, they couldn't do that. Uh, and that's the thing you have to remember about the hammers. There was no CG. Uh, I think a lot of people today say, oh, it looks a bit fakey. But yeah, OK, it does. But um, but I quite like a bit of fakey. I think it actually gives a bit of fantasy to the story as well. Um, but there we are. It, it's, yeah, th quite a few problems with that film. Um, and uh, going back to dogs, um, just very quickly, uh, on The Curse of Frankenstein, they, the one, they like dogs. Terry and Peter both love dogs, I have to say. I used to bring my dog around to see Terry and Morag, um, but there was a dog on Curse of Frankenstein that they had that was supposed to be put to sleep. Sadly, it died um, when it was in uh, anaesthetic. And uh, Peter and Terry, uh, Terry used to talk about that quite often, uh, and it really upset him. And he said, you know, d died for a film. And how, how awful is that? But there you are. In those days, there wasn't the uh, um, protection of animals that there is now. Well, I have to say, uh, Tony, that as a result of what you wrote in your book about the uh, Hound of the Baskervilles, I watched it again. It was on film for only a couple of weeks ago. And somehow because of the miracle of editing and i bet he was part of the magic box as well you can't really sense that everything was going wrong yes the scene is well shall we say perfunctory but it does work it does work and i i think because he cut it it's like the devil rides out uh, you've got the the angel of death coming in it's obviously it was a it was an old horse uh, it was, they had terrible problems it kept wheezing all the time the horse but the way terry cut it uh, was beautiful and he did cut it he, he cut it here everything that terry ever shot was in his head he knew how it was all going to fit together and he worked with the editor in this case i think uh, hound was james needs um great editor from hammer never gets the recognition that uh, he so deserves today um, but he he worked with james on that and i know that the the fight at the end um was very very um, they had to cut it very very carefully um, but you don't notice that the tension is there the the horror is there of something evil attacking them uh, and uh, the mystery is still there i think mystery is a good word because that's what the hound is all about isn't it it's it's a, it's a mystery story uh, it's not really a hound from hell it, it's somebody pretending it's a hound from hell and it really does work it's exceptionally good well, um, towards the end of uh, Terence Fisher's life, um, there was a highly regarded uh, book that came out, uh, written by Carlos Clarence, and it was called An Illustrated History <laughs> of the Horror Film. Now, um, for some reason, uh, Terence Fisher only gets a couple of mentions in the book. Uh, what was his response, Tony? He, he was not a happy bunny about that. Uh, I can remember talking to him. I have a copy here uh, of the book. Uh, and I have to say, um, it was my uh, Bible at the time. Uh, Carlos Clarence was uh, the guy that had written the book on horror films. Um, Leslie Halliwell, uh, whom I worked for for a short period of time, he always uh, said that, you know, it's the, it's the best book on horror uh, at the time. Um, but Terry barely gets to mention. Uh, I think he's mentioned, what, two or three times. I can't remember now from the top of my head. Terry wrote a letter to the publishers, not about the fact that his name doesn't appear in it, but there were several mistakes in the book uh, that he wanted to correct. The letter arrived back, exactly the same letter, which had been opened. Um, presumably to get the address from, I don't know, but more I put it that they they just sent it back without uh, without any um, uh, answer at all because they just didn't want to answer it. Interesting. 
Well, I find I found that writers don't like having their mistakes uh, corrected, and I I did the same thing with a, with another book. I wrote to the author. Um, and there were about three pages of mistakes that I pointed out. He didn't reply to me either. <laughs> there you go. There you go. So if anybody's going to write to me then about my book, then I, I don't reply. That's as simple as that then, presumably. That seems to be the way it's done. <laughs> but after uh, Clarence's book came out, um, uh, Terry was um, rehabilitated in, in another book. And this is A Heritage of Horror. It's a British book um, written by uh, David Perry. And uh, Terence Fisher was much happier with David Perry's take on his career, wasn't he? He loved that book. He I have a copy here, a uh, hard copy. Uh, you've got a paperback there. I'm sorry, David, you've got a paperback there. And it's signed by not only David, but Terry as well. Uh, and because Terry had it by him the whole of the time. And whenever we refer to things, we all refer to David. It's very funny. Um, but he's now rewritten that, I think. It's the new heritage of horror. Right. OK, good. And, uh, and I did refer to it a couple of times, but I referred to that version because Terry knew that version rather than refer to the new version of it. Uh, and we, he loved it so much that we did a season uh, in Brighton based on that book. Uh, uh, which he attended. Brilliant. Br brilliant book. That's marvellous. It is indeed. And now here are two fascinating facts about Carlos Clarence and David Perry, the author of uh, Heritage of Horror. While Carlos Clarence was writing his illustrated history of the horror film, he was appearing in the erotic films of Peter Jerome. And Peter Jerome, grandfather of gay porn, is a peccadillo release. <laughs> And A Heritage of Horror, written by David Perry, has an index compiled by, oh, let me think, what's the name of the guy who, oh, yes, it's me. <laughs> I didn't know that. <laughs> it's true. Now, um, in 1974, you mentioned this earlier, uh, you took uh, Terence Fisher to see the most famous and notorious horror film of its day. It was The Exorcist. What did Terence Fisher think of it? He hated it. Totally and utterly hated it. I loved it. I'd seen it before. I took him to the Odeon in Twickenham. Uh, as it was then, uh, it's now so long as it's gone. And we sat upstairs, I can still see it. Uh, he sat next to me on my right, uh, left hand side and uh, we, we watched this film and I knew he wasn't enjoying it almost not quite from the beginning, uh, but certainly from very early on, the first 15 or 20 minutes, I think, uh, in, I, I, I thought, oh dear, he's not liking this. And he didn't say anything, he was ever so nice. He, Terry was always gentle. He was the shy person that you could probably ever meet. Um, and he um, he came back home and he... Sorry. Why didn't... Oh, have I, why did It was a hugely successful film. He said it was wonderful to look at. He, I, I'm just trying to remember his phrase. It, it's in the book. Um, uh, it, it's some... That it was crap. Yeah. No, no, he, no, he, he, he said that it was a very, prof he said it was very, um, it was good to look at, but um, basically it was good shit. And that's uh, worse to that effect. He said it was absolutely, uh, uh, it, there was nothing there. There was no substance to it. It was all shock horror onwards to the next one. There was no, there was no consistency, no flow. And, you know, seeing it again, writing the book, uh, I, I can see where he was coming from now. I'm, 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 I'm slightly, I'm around about Terry's age now, I'm slightly older perhaps, but I'm around about Terry's age. So uh, one becomes a bit more cynical as you get older and you think you've seen it all. Well, I think uh, I could see where he was coming from on that one. Well, Terence Fisher died in uh, 1980. Why has it taken 40 years for you to write this book, Tony? Well, um, various other people have tried to write a book, uh, I believe. Uh, I, I, I'm in touch with his daughter, Mickey, uh, and uh, she has written the intro for the book. Uh, I tried to get a lot of other people to write the intro, and then I thought, I don't want a lot of people to write the intro. I want Mickey to write it, because it's an authorised biography, and she should write it. Uh, and yeah, it's taken a long time. Uh, there have been various other people trying to write a book, but they never materialized for one reason or another. And that's sad. 
but I, when I came to write it, I was quite determined that it was going to be a full history, not just Hammer, but everything from the first film that he was a clapper boy on all the way through to his last film in 1972, which was released, released in 1974. I'm glad you've done it, uh, Tony. We have to leave it there, alas, but will you stick around for some more probing questions that I'm going to ask on behalf of Patreon subscribers? Okay. Oh, how marvellous. In which case, see you there on Patreon, my dears. Please join me again next week when my guest will be my old colleague, Peter Benedict. Now, if things had gone, gone according to plan, I would now be wrapping up a film called The Wrong People, but of course the pandemic got in the way and uh, the film has now been scheduled for 2022. But Peter Benedict is my co-writer on that project and he's my associate producer. So there are going to be a lot of stories about that next week. Join me then. Until then, this is David McGillivray saying bye-bye. <laughs>